Okay, welcome once again. Are we all having a good time? Yes. Ah, the study of the Bible is wonderful. It's better than real food. Yes. Well, it is real food, let me put it that way. It's better than material, physical food that we partake of. At least I enjoy it more. Um, we're going to study now principle number eight in our syllabus. We are on page 22 of our syllabus. And uh, basically, this principle states in a nutshell, the year-day principle must be applied to the time periods in apocalyptic prophecy. When I say apocalyptic prophecy, I'm referring primarily to the books of Daniel and Revelation. And you have the handout. It uh, has 11 pages. And uh, I just like to say that those who are listening uh, or watching this uh, on the streaming, and those who will watch uh, this programming later on on television, uh, these materials are available from Secrets Unsealed. So uh, those who are, are not here right now, you can uh, contact Secrets Unsealed, and uh, these handouts as well as the presentations uh, will be available. So I just want to make that clear. Now let's go to our introductory matters. As we begin our study, we need to underline two very important facts. First of all, the Bible month consists of 30 days. Now I don't have the time to go into the texts that prove that the biblical month has 30 days, but you can do that. I'm just going to give the references. You need to compare Genesis 7:11 with Genesis 8, 3, and 4. And then compare Deuteronomy 21.13 with Deuteronomy 38, 34 verse 8. And then you can also look at Esther 4.11 and Daniel 6 uh, verse 7 and verse 12. So if you look at those verses you're going to find that the biblical uh, uh, month consists of 30 days. Uh, also the Bible year consists of 12 months. And the texts for that are 1 Kings 4, verse 7, uh, and 1 Chronicles chapter 27, and verses 1 through 15, where the months are actually named. And so uh, we need to know from the get go that the biblical month has 30 days and the biblical year has 12 months. That's crucially important. The year day principle basically means that when the time periods are used in the context of apocalyptic events, that's primarily Daniel and Revelation, which occur between the year 34 and the second coming of Christ, they are to be understood by applying the principle that one literal calendar day is equivalent to one literal calendar year. This is known as the year-day principle, or the day-year principle, day for a year. The Preterist and Futurist schools, which we've taken a look at already, adamantly deny the year-day principle. Most Preterists interpret the little horn of Daniel 7, as well as the little horn of Daniel chapter 8, as a nasty individual called Antiochus Epiphanes, who ruled from 171 B.C. to 164 B.C. And uh, basically, uh, he was a Macedonian ruler who desecrated the Jewish temple from 167 to 164 B.C. And Predators believe that the three and one half years and the 2300 days are literal time and they apply to the period of dominion of Antiochus Epiphanes towards the end of the Old Testament period. So in other words, these periods have no relevance for us today because they were fulfilled in the distant past. On the other hand, most futurists teach that the little horn of Daniel 7 represents a future personal antichrist who will sit in a rebuilt Jewish temple in the Middle East for three and one half literal years at the end of the Christian dispensation or towards the end of the Christian dispensation. They also believe that the little horn of Daniel 8 represents Antiochus Epiphanes and that the 2300 days are literal time. 
the common denominator of both systems is that they believe that the three and one half times and the 2300 days are to be taken as literal time. In contrast, historicism or the historical flow method as I prefer to call it, has always held that days, weeks, months, and years in an apocalyptic context should be understood symbolically by applying the year-day principle. So do you understand the contrast between these systems of interpretation? Preterism and Futurism says that the time periods are literal time, whereas the historical flow method teaches that these time periods are to be understood on the basis of the year-day principle, that each literal day stands for a literal year. Now I want to share with you 20 reasons for applying the year-day principle, and uh, some of these reasons are quite complex, I've tried to simplify them as much as possible, and I hope that you've read this material in advance, because, uh, because it will be very, very helpful uh, in our going through this material. Reason number one, the expression time, times, and the dividing of time, 42 months, 1,260 days, and 70 weeks are very peculiar. Would you agree? They could have been expressed in literal language, but instead they are given a symbolic flavor. Notice for example, that Luke 4.25 and James 5.17 refer to the period when there was no rain in the days of Elijah as three years and six months. This is the normal way of expressing time, isn't that? Isn't it? Three years and six months or three and a half years, that's the normal way. But the apocalyptic passages do not use the normal way of expressing time. They use peculiar expressions. It is significant that every measurement of calendar time in prophecy is given a symbolic flavor. Hour, Revelation 17, 12 and 9, 13. Day, Revelation 12, verse 6. Week, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Month, Revelation 13, verse 5. And year, Daniel 7, 25. Do you notice that all of the measurements of time use this principle? It is also significant that non-apocalyptic prophecies, that is prophecies, uh, classical prophecies and typological prophecies, express time in literal language. Like for example, 70 years of Babylonian captivity, 400 years that Israel would spend in Egypt, 120 years at the time of the flood. So when you're dealing with literal persons performing literal actions, you have literal time periods. Does that make sense? Yes. Reason number two. The symbolic time periods are always found within the context of apocalyptic passages where symbols predominate. Are you understanding this point? In other words, the time periods are used with a host of other symbols in the same context. For example, the three and one half times are found in the context of four symbolic beasts, a symbolic sea, symbolic winds, symbolic clouds, symbolic horns, and a symbolic little horn. So would you expect the time period to be symbolic? Of course. Similarly, the 1260 days are found in the context where a symbolic woman clothed with a symbolic sun stands on a symbolic moon with 12 symbolic stars on her head. She is persecuted by a symbolic dragon who has seven symbolic heads, ten symbolic horns, and who casts a third of the symbolic stars to the earth. So why would the time period not be symbolic? In Revelation 13, the 42 months are found within a context where a symbolic composite beast with ten symbolic horns receives its power from a symbolic dragon. 
It also arises from a symbolic sea, later uses a symbolic Im uh, raises a symbolic image beast to impose a symbolic mark. So once again, the time period is expressed within a very symbolic context where symbols predominate. The same could be said about Daniel 8, where the 2300 day prophecy is found. We have a symbolic ram, a symbolic he goat, and a symbolic little horn. It only stands to reason that if the scenes where these time periods are found in are symbolic, then the time periods must also be symbolic. Now does that make sense? Yes. Absolutely. Reason number three, we're on a roll, praise the Lord. The little horn of Daniel 7 arose among the ten horns on the head of the fourth beast. It is clear from history that the Roman Empire was fragmented when the barbarians came from the northern sector of the empire and carved it up. Daniel 7 makes it clear that there are no gaps in the historical flow of nations. The lion is succeeded immediately by the bear. The bear is immediately succeeded by the leopard. The leopard is immediately succeeded by the dragon beast. The dragon beast then sprouts the ten horns, and the little horn then rises among the ten. Are you following the sequence? Yes. Now, if the little horn arose among the ten, and the ten were complete in 476 A.D., and the little horn ruled until the judgment, are you understanding me? When does the judgment begin? In 1844. Then the three and one half times of the dominion of the little horn must be 1260 years and not literal days. Are you catching the point? Yes. If the days were literal, then the little horn would have ruled only from 476 to 479 AD. But the fact is that the Roman Catholic Church ruled for 1260 years. Does that reason make sense? Reason number four, Daniel 8 makes it crystal clear that the 2300 day prophecy was for the time of the end. Is that clear? Yes. Several times, Daniel 8, 14, Daniel 8, 17, and Daniel 8 verses 26 and 27 say that this prophecy is for the time of the end. Daniel 12 verses 4 and 7 underscore the fact that the book which contains the 2300 day prophecy would be closed and sealed until the time of the end, and therefore could not be understood until then. This being the case, those who believe that Antiochus is the little horn of Daniel 8 find themselves in a serious dilemma. Assuming that Antiochus is represented by the little horn of Daniel 8, and that the 2300 days were the literal time period of his dominion, a question immediately comes to the fore. Why would we have to wait until the time of the end to understand this? Are you following me? Because it says, this aspect of the 2300 days could not be understood until the time of the end. But if it was fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes, why would we have to wait till, till the time of the end to understand it? You could have understood it already. Now continuing, yet we know that they were not living in the time of the end because over 2,000 years of history have transpired since that time. We're talking here about Porphyry, who in the first centuries of the Christian era believed that Antiochus Epiphanes was the little horn of Daniel 8. Now if they were right, then they were living in the time of the end, right? If Porphyry is right and the little horn represents Antiochus Epiphanes, then they were living in the time of the end because this prophecy is for the time of the end. Now the next paragraph. The simple reality is that Antiochus did not fulfill the little horn prophecy. Josephus and others mistakenly identified Antiochus as the fulfillment. They could not have comprehended the little horn prophecy because they did not live in the time of the end. Are you understanding this point? Very important point. If the prophecy, folks, is for the time of the end, the 2300 day prophecy is for the time of the end, then 
Antiochus Epiphanes could not have fulfilled it, because you would have understood that it was fulfilled in his time. So we continue, Josephus and others mistakenly identified Antiochus as the fulfillment. They could not have comprehended the little horn prophecy because they did not live in the time of the end. It is clear that this prophecy was not present truth in the days of Daniel, or of Josephus, or even of Martin Luther. None of these men lived in the time of the end, and therefore none of them could understand this prophecy. It became present truth when the prophecy was fulfilled in 1844. What was the central verse that was used by the Millerite movement? Unto 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Is that the time when this prophecy was understood? Yes. yes. So it was not understood in the past. So the 2300 days must have been what? They must have been years. Because they reach way back from the time that the command is given to build Jerusalem and restore Jerusalem all the way till 1844. It has to be years. It can't be days. This is why the Millerites preached on this very text. The book of Daniel was being opened, and now the time period of the 2300 days could be understood. Is this point clear? Yes. Let's go to reason number five. The vision of Daniel 8, this should be 1 through 12 incidentally, covers the whole period of the ram, the he-goat, and the little horn until the cleansing of the sanctuary. This is a very important point. The vision that is shown to Daniel goes from the times of the ram to the he-goat and then to the point when the judgment begins, when the cleansing of the sanctuary begins. That's the vision. And there's a particular Hebrew word that is used there, which is the word chazon. That's the word vision that is used. Now in Daniel 8 verse 13, the question is asked, until when shall the vision be? What vision is it referring to? The whole vision. It's the same word that is used in verses 1 and 2, where Daniel says, I saw a vision. So it includes the ram, it includes the he-goat, and it includes the time when the judgment begins. The context indicates that the word vision includes the totality of what Daniel had seen in Daniel 8 to that point. Then in Daniel 8 verse 15, we are told that Daniel wished to comprehend the vision. Same word. He wanted to comprehend the vision. What does the vision include, folks? It includes the ram, it includes the he-goat, all the way to the time when the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. The answer is simple. Which vision? That's the question. Which vision is this talking about? The answer is simple. It must be the totality of the vision of Daniel 8, because when the angel Gabriel comes to explain the vision in answer to Daniel's request, he begins with Persia, and then continues with Greece, the little horn, and culminates with the conclusion of the 2300 days when the sanctuary is to be cleansed. So the word vision includes the totality of the vision, right? It includes the ram, the he-goat, the little horn, up to the point when the sanctuary is to be cleansed or the judgment is to begin. Thus it is clear that the 2300 days which cover the whole vision of Daniel 8 must involve what? Centuries, not literal days. And literal days would be six uh, and one-half literal years, approximately. Incidentally, this explains the reason why Daniel 8 begins with Persia and not with Babylon. You know, usually we say, well, the reason why Daniel 8 doesn't begin with a symbol for Babylon is because Babylon is about to, about to disappear from history. But that's not the real reason. Because Babylon was still going to rule for 12 years. So Babylon was not at the point of passing away. There's another reason why Daniel 8 begins with, Medo -Per with Persia instead of beginning with Babylon like Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. You say, what is that reason? Let's continue. The 2300 days begin when Persia gives the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. And that is why the vis vision begins with Persia. Because if you had begun with Babylon, it would give the impression that the 2300 days have to begin with the kingdom of Babylon. Are you following me or not? 
Thus Daniel 8 and 9 must be connected in order to comprehend the 2300 day prophecy. Is this point clear? Yes. Now, uh, notice this chart that you have at the top of page 4. The chart at the top of page 4. Do you see there? The vision equals what? The ram, the he goat, pagan and papal Rome, which uh, is symbolized by the little horn, up to the point of the judgment. So the question is, when the, when the question is asked, until when is the vision? The answer is, 2300 days is the vision. Can that be six and a half years? Come on, be real. It includes all of this. So the 2300 days must be years. They have to be years. Because the 2300 days covered the entire vision. And the vision includes the ram, the he goat, pagan, papal Rome, up to the time when the judgment begins. Is that clear? Now let's go to reason number six. What do conservative evangelical scholars do with the prophecy of the 70 weeks? See here you have a fly in the ointment. Don't they have to employ the year-day principle to convert the weeks to years? Are you understanding the question? The answer is that they attempt to get off the hook by saying that the expression 70 weeks really means 77s or even 70 weeks of years. In this way they get rid of the year-day principle. This they must do because if they employed the year-day principle for the 70 weeks, they would have to employ it for the other prophetic periods in order to be consistent. Let us now look at a few facts about the word translated week here in Daniel 9. Is it true that that it, 70 weeks is 77s or 70 weeks of years? Is that really what it means? So that you don't have to apply the year-day principle? That's not what it means at all. Let's notice the evidence. Is it true that the Hebrew word Shabua, which is week, should be translated sevens or weeks of years? This word is used a total of 19 times in the Hebrew scriptures, the word Shabua, which is week. And in every single instance, it refers to a literal week of seven days. And you have all of the references there, I put them in parentheses for you. Evangelicals frequently use Daniel 10, 2 and 3 as an argument for translating the word Shabua as weeks of years. They point out, and this is an important point, they point out that in these verses the word weeks is qualified by the word days. In other words, weeks of days. Daniel is speaking about his period of fasting. He said, I, I fasted for three weeks of days. That's what it literally says in the Hebrew. So they say, see, if this is weeks of days, then the other one is weeks of years. But there are problems with that interpretation. They then imply that if these are weeks with the qualifier days, then the other weeks without the qualifier days must mean weeks of years. Are you catching their argument? It's pretty crafty, but it don't work. For example, the New International Version translates the word week with seven or sevens in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, but then translates the very same word as weeks in Daniel 10, verses 2 and 3. Isn't that interesting? The problem with such an explanation is that it ignores the meaning of the Hebrew idiom, weeks of days. What is meant by Daniel when he says that he fasted for three weeks of days? Let's notice. When the word week in Hebrew is qualified by the word days, it simply means full weeks. Three full weeks when it says weeks of days. Notice the following examples. In Genesis 19, 29, 14, and Numbers 11, 20, and 21, and Judges 19, verse 2, the Hebrew literally reads, month of days. Is there a month that does not consist of days? <laughs> Furthermore, in Genesis 41, verse 1, Leviticus 25, 29, 2 Samuel 13, 23, and 1428, 
the Hebrew literally reads years of days, but the translators have recognized that this means full years, and they translate it that way. Are you understanding the point? But they have to get rid of the year-day principle for the 70 weeks, because if they don't, they say, uh-oh, we've got to apply it to the 2300 days, we have to apply it to the 1260 days, they run into trouble. So they have to find a way to explain away the 70 weeks without having to apply the year-day principle. The fundamental reason why futurist and preterist, preterist scholars refuse to translate Shabuah in Daniel 9 as weeks is because they would then have to admit, in order to be consistent, that the year-day principle must be applied to the other prophetic periods as well. Furthermore, if they applied the year-day principle to the 70 weeks, they would have to apply it to the 2300 days of which the 70 weeks constitute the first part. And this would force them to admit that prophecy was fulfilled in 1844. This would then make them Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> Incidentally, the Septuagint translates the Hebrew Shabua with the Greek Hebdomas. This word is consistently translated weak. So much for the idea of trying to explain away the 70 weeks and say we don't have to use the year-day principle. You do have to use the year-day principle with the 70 weeks. And if you use it for the 70 weeks, you have to use it for the other prophetic time periods as well. Reason number seven. A comparison of Daniel, 11, Daniel 8, 11 to 13 and 23 to 25 with Daniel 11, 31 to 45, also reveals why Antiochus cannot be represented by the little horn. As we compare these two passages, it becomes crystal clear that the king of the north of Daniel 11 represents the same power as the little horn of both Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. And by the way, futurist scholars agree. And preterist scholars agree. They say, yes, that's right. The power in Daniel 8, 11 to 13, 23 to 25, and Daniel 11, 31 to 35, 45, represents the same power. Only they believe uh, that it was Antiochus Epiphanes, and some believe that it's a future Antichrist. Now, particularly in Daniel 11, but also in Daniel 7 and 8, it is clear that the king of the north is the last power to rule earth before Christ sets up his everlasting kingdom. You can notice that in Daniel 11, the, it, it says, He shall come to His end, and none to help Him. In other words, the last power to rule on earth is going to be the king of the north. And we also know that it's going to be the little horn, because he's destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. Now, this is also true of the little horn of Daniel 8. He is broken without hand, an expression that is used in Daniel 2.34, Daniel 8.25, and 11.45. The little horn, or king of the north, is destroyed by Christ at His coming. Obviously this makes it impossible for Antiochus Epiphanes to be the little horn. <laughs> Unless Antiochus Epiphanes resurrects. <laughs> and I don't think anybody would stand for that, not even liberal or conservative dispensationalist scholars. Let's continue. Daniel 11, 31 to 45, also contains many, many elements which are in common with the little horn of Daniel 7. These considerations leave no doubt that the little horn of Daniel 7, the little horn of Daniel 8, and the king of the north of Daniel 11 symbolize the same power. Thus, those who see the little horn of Daniel 7 as a future antichrist and the one in Daniel 8 as Antiochus Epiphanes, are at a loss to explain why Daniel 11 blends the description of the little horn of Daniel 7 with that of the little horn of Daniel 8. Why would Daniel 11 blend the two descriptions if they represented two different powers, one past and the other future? Reason number 8. In the book of Daniel, the word days can mean years. That shows that the Hebrews use this principle. They use the word days to express years. And this is found in the book of Daniel. Let's notice. 
Daniel 1 verse 5 refers to three years. But in Daniel 1.18 the same period is described as what? As days. The seven times of Daniel 4.25 are referred to as days in Daniel 4.34. Daniel 5.11 speaks of days of Nebuchadnezzar. That means the years of Nebuchadnezzar. These days were obviously years. And then you can compare Daniel 2, 28 and 44, where latter days and days of these kings means what? Years. So Daniel itself uses interchangeably days and years. Reason number nine. The historical books of the Old Testament use days and years in parallel fashion. Notice the following examples, and we're not going to read all of these, but you can look them up. Exodus 13 verse 10 literally reads in Hebrew that the Passover was to be celebrated from days to days. That's the way it reads in Hebrew. The Passover was to be celebrated from days to days. What does that mean? From year to year, and that's the way that it's translated, even though the Hebrew says, from days to days. In 1 Samuel 20 verse 6, the Hebrew literally reads, sacrifice of the days. But the context clearly shows it refers to the yearly sacrifice. So for, for the Hebrew thinking, days is interchangeable with what? Interchangeable with years in the historical books of the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 2.19, Literally, the Hebrew says, from days to days, and it's translated from years to years. 1 Samuel 1.21 literally reads in the Hebrew, sacrifice of the days, translations render it, sacrifice of the years, or the yearly sacrifice. You find the same thing in Judges 11 verse 40, it literally reads, from days to days, four days each year. It means from year to year, four days each year. 1 Samuel 27 verse 7 literally reads days and four months. <laughs> what does that mean? It means a year and four months. 1 Kings 1 1 says that David was stricken in days. But what does that mean he was stricken in days? It, he was stricken in years. Genesis 47 verse 9 is an interesting verse in that Jacob speaks of the days of my years. Literally in Hebrew it says, the days of my years. In Genesis 5 verse 5, we find that Adam, the days of Adam were 930 years. And in Genesis 6 verse 3, you have once again, days linked with years. It says, his days will be 120 years. So is it common in Hebrew way of expression to use days and years interchangeably? Yes, it was common among the Hebrews to do this. Now let's go to reason number 10. Not only do we find Daniel using days and years in a similar fashion, not only do we find the historical books of the Old Testament also using days and years interchangeably, we also find that in Old Testament Hebrew poetry, days and years are employed in synonymous parallelism. You know what synonymous parallelism is? Hebrew poetry is characterized by parallelism, and there are three basic types. There are variations, but there are three basic types. One is called synonymous parallelism. That's where the first line in, in, in the verse is repeated in the second line, but in different words. It's parallel to the first line, but different words are used. Then you have antithetical parallelism, which is the first line, the opposite is said in the second line. And then you have what is called synthetic parallelism, which is where the thought of the first line is completed in the second line. Now a synonymous parallelism is where the first line and the second line are synonymous, but in different words. In Hebrew poetry, you find days and you find years used in synonymous parallelism. Let's notice, for example, and you can look up all of these texts, a very interesting text is Psalm 90 verses 9 and 10, where the translation reads, 
years of our lives. But literally in Hebrew it reads the days of our years. In every place, listen carefully, in every place where the Old Testament couples days with years, the word day is in the A line and the word year is in the B line. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, in the first line you have the word day. In the second line, which is parallel or synonymous, you have year. In other words, the day is equivalent to what? A year. Just check out these verses. It is so interesting. William Shea, who was my teacher at the seminary, wrote a very interesting book called Selected Studies in Prophetic Interpretation, and on page 69 he says this, and a good share of this material he has in this uh, chapter that he wrote on the year-day principle. He says this, When we come to the occurrence of the word days in time prophecies, therefore, an ancient Semite, you know, understand what he means by an ancient Semite? Someone, yeah, a Jew, somebody who has, has a Semitic background. An ancient Semite whose mind was steeped in this parallelistic type of thought would naturally have made an association of years with the days, found in a symbolic context, just as he naturally would have identified years as the B word that would follow the A word days in its occurrence as part of a well-known parallel pair. So you can check out these verses, and uh, you know I'll mention some of them, Job 10 verse 5, uh, Job 15 verse 20, Job 32 verse 7, uh, Deuteronomy 32 verse 7, and Psalm 77 verse 5. And you know what's interesting is that the first book of the Bible to be written was the book of Job. So very, very early, it was written by Moses in the desert of Midian while he was tending Jethro's sheep, according to the spirit of prophecy. And there are some sections of the book of Job that use such archaic Hebrew language that the Septuagint translators, the translators of the Greek Old Testament, had real struggles in translating the, that Hebrew to Greek. They leave whole sections untranslated because it was such archaic old Hebrew. And so it's interesting that you have these references from Job where the A line has days and the B line, the parallel line, has years. Days are years. Is that clear? Reason number 11. The prophetic books also do the same thing. The prophetic books of the Old Testament, days, are also used interchangeably with years. For instance, Ezekiel 30 verse 3 refers to the day of the Lord, but Isaiah calls it the year of the Lord. Isaiah 10 verse 3 speaks of the day of visitation, but Jeremiah 11 23 refers to the same event as the year of visitation. Isaiah 34 verse 8 speaks of the year of recompense, but Hosea 9 verse 7 refers to the days of recompense. Do you see that the prophets, they, for them days and years had a very close and intimate relationship. Of course we would not want to leave out the traditional texts which have been used by Seventh-day Adventists to corroborate the year-day principle. In both Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4 verse 6, God Himself employs the year-day principle in the context of prophecy. And uh, if we have time, we'll deal with miniature symbolization. That is a fascinating study. It's a follow-up to this study about the year-day principle. Now let's go to reason number 12. We can also approach this subject from the perspective of the sabbatical and jubilee years. Have you ever heard of the sabbatical year? That's uh, every seventh year was a year of rest, and then every 49th year was a year of rest, followed by the jubilee, which was the 50th year. Now, where does this pattern come from? The, the pattern of the sabbatical year and the jubilee. Where does that come from? It comes from the weekly cycle of days. That's the pattern. Let's, let's follow this. It is obvious that the weekly Sabbath is the foundation for both of these. That is to say the seventh day of the week becomes symbolic of the seventh year. And the 49th day becomes symbolic of the 49th year. Leviticus 25, 1 through 7 addresses the sabbatical year. This passage contains the earliest biblical use of the year-day principle. 
it becomes clear when we compare verses 3 and 4 with verse 5 that the weekly cycle is being used as a pattern for the seven year period. In other words, that each day of the week becomes symbolic of what? A year in the sabbatical year and a year in the jubilee. Now notice, we have six years which are followed by the seventh year, and the seventh year is one of rest. This arrangement is patterned after six days of labor, followed by the seventh day, which is a day of rest. Here we clearly have an example of the year-day principle. The same is true of the jubilee year. Are you understanding this point? A day, the week of days is used as a pattern for the seven year cycle of the sabbatical year. The foundation is the literal days of the week. Let's go to reason number 13. If we accept the testimony of Jesus, the little horn of Daniel 8 cannot represent Antiochus Epiphanes. Jesus made it clear that the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel was still in the future in his day. Did he do that? Oh, you better believe he did. How could Antiochus, who lived in the second century before Christ, fulfill a prophecy which Jesus clearly indicated was still unfulfilled in his day? Furthermore, the little horn of Daniel 7 could not have been fulfilled by Antiochus either, because the Apostle Paul specified that this horn was still future in his day. The book of Revelation also places the fulfillment of this prophecy in the future. Do you understand that point? Well, some of you do. <laughs> Reason number 14. As a rule of thumb, the shorter the time period in apocalyptic prophecy, the more likely it is to be symbolic of a longer time period. For example, is it really possible to fit into one literal week all the events spoken of in the last of the 70 weeks? Come on, be real. There's no way you can fit all of those events into one literal week. Would ten literal days of persecution during the period of Smyrna really be such a terrible ordeal? Would three and one half literal days be enough to fulfill all of the events of Revelation 11? Impossible, folks. If in Revelation 11 the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two lampstands, the sackcloth, etc. are all symbolic, then why isn't the time period also symbolic? Reason number 15. You thought we only had one reason, Ezekiel chapter 4. We have a plethora of reasons that support the year-day principle that the Seventh-day Adventist Church upholds. Reason number 15. Preterists and futurists who apply these prophetic time periods literally encounter serious problems in another sense as well. In the Old Testament, God is presented as the one who reveals the course of human history and provides His div divine evaluation of that history. There we find a revelation of the continuous and unbroken flow of human history from creation until the first coming of the Messiah. Is that true? In the Old Testament we find every event, the, on the whole flow from creation until the times of the Messiah. The Gospels then present the story of Jesus' ministry on earth. The book of Acts and the epistles continue the flow by describing the history of the early church. Do we have a continuous flow method here? Yes, yes we do. After this is where the preterists encounter serious problems. You see, in the preterist view, there is no revelation from God concerning the entire history of the Christian church. There are almost 2,000 years of silence because they believe that these prophecies were fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes and with Nero. Revelation has nothing to do with the history of the Christian church, they say. So God has been silent about history for 2,000 years. There are almost 2,000 years of silence. According to them, God's description and evaluation of history ended with Antiochus Epiphanes and the Roman emperors in the early church. The futurists are not in much better shape. 
According to this school, Revelation 4 through 19 refers to a short period of human history at the very end of time. Likewise, God's description and evaluation of human history as found in Daniel, according to them, ends with the Roman Empire and does not pick up again until the last seven years of human history. Thus there is a 2,000 year gap in God's description and evaluation of human history. With the brief exception of the seven churches, God has been silent about the events of the church for 2,000 years. Are you understanding this point? Only the historicist method is able to reveal a God who is concerned with His church during the entire period of church history, including the period of dominion of the little horn. Only historicism is able to show the providential guidance of God in human history and His loving care for His church during the last 2,000 years. Amen. God is a God who is engaged. Reason number 16. The Apostle Paul makes it absolutely clear that the man of sin, this is an important reason, was already working in his day. Is that true? Yeah. And yet this man of sin will not be destroyed until Jesus comes. Whoa! How could this be a literal person if he was alive in Paul's day and yet is not destroyed until Jesus comes? He's not a centenarian, he's a millenarian. Is this one literal man who has lived over 2,000 years? The inevitable conclusion is that the man of sin cannot be a literal man, nor can his period of dominion be literal time. It is also significant that Paul is getting his picture of the man of sin from the little horn of Daniel 7, and the little horn of Daniel 8, and the king of the north of Daniel 11. This being the case, the little horn and the king of the north must have ruled for centuries not for literal days. Reason number 17. The acid test of the year day principle is whether the events forecasted were fulfilled on schedule. In other words, the pragmatic test of historical fulfillment must be applied to the historicist interpretation of these prophecies. Does the historicist method pass the test? Well, notice the following incontrovertible facts. Did the papacy rule for 1260 years? Absolutely. Can these dates be corroborated by history? Yes. Did the church during the period of Smyrna experience 10 years of severe persecution? Yes, the year 303 to 313. Terrible persecution the church suffered during the emperorship of Diocletian. There you have, during the church of Smyrna, the church that is persecuted by the Roman emperors, you have ten days that are mentioned in connection with that church. Ten years, 303 to 313, it can be proven. Can it be proved that Jesus came in the year 27 AD to be baptized, and He was baptized? Yes. That He died in the middle of the week? Yes. And that Stephen was stoned in the year 34? Absolutely. Was this prophecy of the 70 weeks fulfilled? Yes. It was. How about the prophecy of the 2300 days? The Millerites did indeed preach from Daniel 8.14 that the sanctuary was about to be cleansed. And this preaching took place right before the 2300 years came to an end. Why didn't they preach from some other text? Simply because God wanted to bring to the world's attention that the 2300 years were about to end and a significant event was about to take place in heaven. The great second advent awakening in the 1830s provides powerful evidence that the year day principle must be applied to Daniel 8 verse 14. Amen. Historical fulfillment shows that this is the way to interpret these time prophecies. Finally, the churches were closed and Bibles were forbidden in France during the French Revolution according to Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 11, for about three and one half years, from March of 1793 to November of 1797. It did happen exactly the way it says in Revelation 11. So the acid test of historical fulfillment shows that these days are not days, that these months are not months, but these days and months are actually what? Years. years. 
Reason number 18. I leave this till last because scholars are not always right. Many great Bible scholars, both Seventh-day Adventists and non-Seventh-day Adventists, have understood and taught the year-day principle. Unfortunately, after the great disappointment of 1844, and we've studied this in a previous class, Protestants gave up on the year-day principle and used that was used by the Millerite to calculate prophetic time periods. In other words, because Jesus did not come as predicted in 1844, the Protestant world threw out the method which the Millerites had used. Thus they threw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater. We will limit ourselves to comments which were made by two men whose last name is Newton. One is Sir Isaac Newton. Have you ever heard of him? Notice what he says. Three times and a half. That is for 1,260 solar years. Reckoning as time for a calendar year of 360 days and a day for a solar year after which the judgment is to sit, and they shall take away his dominion, not at once, but by degrees, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. See, he had the year-day principle right, Sir Isaac Newton. And then there was another individual, Bishop Thomas Newton, who said this, We must therefore compute the time according to the nature and genius of the prophetic language. A time and times and half a time are three years and a half. And the ancient Jewish year consisting of twelve months and each month of thirty days. A time and times and half a time, or three years and a half, are reckoned in Revelation 11, 2 and 3, 12, 6 and 14, as equivalent to forty-two months or a, a thousand two hundred and three score days. And a day in the style of the prophets is a year. I have appointed thee each day for a year, saith God to Ezekiel 4, verse 6. And it is confessed that the seventy weeks in the ninth chapter of Daniel are weeks of years, and consequently 1260 days are 1260 years. Interesting. Neither of these individuals was a Seventh-day Adventist, and yet they believed in the year-day principle. Let's go to reason number 19, because time is running out. Practically every futurist writer is willing to concede that the seven churches represent seven periods of church history. Even conservative uh, scholars particularly, they say the seven churches represent seven periods of church history. Most see Ephesus as a symbol of the apost apostolic church. Let's take a look at the fourth church, Thyatira. It is obvious to any objective reader that this church bears many similarities to the condition of Israel during the period of Elijah. Notice the following parallels. In both cases Jezebel instigated the apostasy. In both cases the cardinal sins were fornication and idolatry. In both cases there was no rain. In both cases Elijah fled. In both cases Elijah was sustained in his flight to the wilderness. In both cases the apostasy lasted three and a half years. Church of Thyatira and the experience of Elijah. These parallels indicate that the church during the period of Thyatira is reliving the story of Elijah. Yet the historical period of the church of Thyatira does not last only three and one half literal years, not even by the calculations of conservative non Adventist scholars. Are you understanding my point? If in Revelation 2 Jezebel is not one literal person, Elijah is not one historical person, rain is not literal rain, fornication is not literal fornication, etc., then the three and a half years are not literal years either. Time and space will now allow us to show that the heart of Revelation 17 represents the second future stage of this Jezebel period of the church. In the case of literal Old Testament Elijah, now this is interesting, in the case of literal Old Testament Elijah, the time period when there was no rain was expressed in normal terms as three years and six months, because the time period was literal. But in the case of symbolic Elijah, the period is described as 1,260 days and time, times, and the dividing of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now reason number 20 is one that I mentioned previously. The thousand years of Revelation, you have this sheet, I don't have time to say much about it, but you have this... Um, chart the year day principle in Isaiah 24 and Revelation 20 to 22. 
Uh, some people say, well, why don't you use the year-day principle for the thousand years of Revelation 20? To be consistent, that's in an apocalyptic prophecy, right? So why don't we use the year-day principle for the thousand years of Revelation 20? Why don't we uh, say that, th uh, that that also needs to, to have the year-day principle applied to it? It's very simple. We already studied this, remember? Notice this chart. It's a very interesting chart. On the left side you have Isaiah 24, on the right side you have Revelation 20 to 22. You have all of the parallels between Isaiah 24 and Revelation 20 to 22. Now, you have capitalized one key word in the left hand column, what is it? Days. The word days. What is the equivalent word in the right hand column? Years. It is years. You see, we don't have to apply the year day principle to the thousand years, because Isaiah already does that. Remember we studied this? Isaiah says that the, that the kings of the earth and the hosts of the high ones will be punished for how long? For many days. Revelation, on the other hand, says that the kings of the earth that will be destroyed when Jesus comes, according to chapter 19, and the devil will be bound to the earth for how long? For 1,000 years. So days in Isaiah is interpreted as years in Revelation. The Bible itself, when you compare one text with another, contains the year-day principle. So my question is, do we have sufficient reason from Scripture to believe that in Bible prophecy, apocalyptic prophecies, a day is equivalent to a year? We have an abundance of evidence, folks, that that's what needs to happen. But the Christian world says no, because if they said yes, they would be Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> Perish the thought, right? And yet the world is out there anxious to know the truth. And I believe that when we share these things, and I found as I've shared these things with people, they say, wow, you know, this makes so much sense. I never knew these things. People need to know that the year-day principle is firmly biblical because then we can show them the career of the papacy, we can show them the 2300-day prophecy, and they will be proud to be members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. All right, folks, any questions on what we studied? Was it, was it pretty clear? We were going fast because I wanted to...